Well, hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Rice Cast. Thank you for staying with us as we fought through snowy, inclement weather the last couple <laughs> weeks. Couldn't come up here to record. That's not true, of course. We are in uh, beautiful Clearwater, Florida. Absolutely beautiful today. Go- I love it. We get our sweaters out a little bit. This I get more in the Christmas spirit when it's a little cold. A little outside. cold, but still absolutely gorgeous. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great because we're seeing all the folks from the north coming down. You right. You know, all, all of our winter guests. And then many will come back after the holidays. But, uh, you know, beautiful weather and no reason they shouldn't come down. They see us in the sweaters, and they make their jokes. They make their jokes. They say, this is the middle of summer. For yeah. <laughs> and I say, well, that's why you should live here. That's right. Because <laughs> it's perfect right now. Uh, it is beautiful, and it has been a couple of weeks, Pastor. How much have you missed the podcast? So very much, very much. Yeah, I know over the holidays, uh, some co- scheduling conflicts and so forth. So it's good to get back at it. Hope everyone had a great uh, Thanksgiving holiday. And, of course, now we're in the thick of the Christmas season with a lot of huge events coming up here in the next um, two and a half weeks or so as yep. we it just seems like, boy, it races. Here we are in the oh, middle yeah. of it. It's just coming right on us. But uh, we're in the middle of the Christmas season and many, many things happening here at Calvary right now. So many things. I want to talk a little about the stuff that's coming up, but you just reminded me. It, we just I don't think we got to do a podcast after. But the Thanksgiving communion service hmm. felt like I, I was able to be here for yeah. it. I was hosting online while here, and it was a pretty special night. I mean, that was... You know, you just have moments that are um, uh, moments that you remember and are memorable. The Lord's presence was so real and so special. People worshiped. They gave thanks. And uh, I can't remember a communion service that uh, we've enjoyed more or had more comments about. And uh, it was it was a true night of worship. And yeah. uh, we we really enjoyed it. And of course, it's it's always special when we get, you know, people from all four campuses together. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, because some of those people have been together, you know, we've we've been in fellowship and now they're in other places. We don't get to see them as much. And and uh, they're at Seminole, they're at Crystal Beach, East Lake. And, and to get everybody back together and it's just a wonderful night. It was a great night of worship. Super special. If you missed it, I'll put it in the show notes, the link to the to the YouTube link, and, th- and that will be great. But being in that room no, it was, was nothing like being there. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Like it just was, you know, I even got to talk to Kyle, Pastor Kyle afterward and just say, you're just, there's just nights oh, where it yeah. just, something happens. Yeah. The Lord's and presence was, one of them. was, was so sweet that night. It was, it was amazing. Go back and watch that if you haven't seen it yet. And I'm also just recollecting now, didn't you go away a little for Thanksgiving? You get yes, a little time uh, our out? family was uh, away that week and uh, all of our kids, this is our year with all of our kids and grandkids together. And uh, Cheryl's parents also uh, were there. So we had a, a good time up in the mountains of uh, Tennessee and North Carolina and enjoyed our time up there. Well, that's good. That's good. Glad to hear that. And we are on to Christmas now. Mm-hmm. As we record this, we are just days away from mm-hmm. the Christmas night of worship. Uh, have you gotten to walk through the worship center? Yes. Uh, people are going to be uh, surprised when they see it. Our team has done a great job, as they always do, but it seems like they've gone a little uh, above this time, and uh, it's going to be a great night, uh, Saturday and Sunday night of this upcoming weekend, uh, which is um, what are, whatever the dates are. Uh, ninth and 10th. Ninth and 10th. Yep. And um, uh, it's going to be two great nights. Hope everyone plans to come. A lot of family activities on Saturday afternoon. That's right. You know, all that's on our website. But uh, if you're hearing it this week, hope you'll show up this weekend. Yeah. And uh, we'll have a great, great time uh, both nights. It's going to be amazing. And yeah, that there's a family fun event. Saturday starts at 430. It's free. Just come on out a little early. Bring the kids. There's always activities yep. and cocoa. Yep. What we like to do is we like to get them sugared up right before we ask them to <laughs> sit down and watch some Yeah. Uh, but it's going to be – it really is. The t- Kyle and the team, I mean, I we can't it, – It's we joke, but you can't shout out our production team here enough. Nick Grossibel and the, mm. and the team, they just are I don't think most people have any idea of how hard they work mm. uh, to do these kinds of things. And, I mean, if we paid them by the hour, we'd go broke, I think. You know, we, we just – um, they, it's just unbelievable what they do. And sometimes maybe we ought to do a behind the scenes, uh, yeah. you know, a video cast or something. Yeah. People just, it's remarkable how much work goes into this. And, and the thing that always amazes me, I'll take one more second on them, but these production guys, 
They generally live in a world that's a little grumpy. Most production guys you deal with, they're a little grumpy at all times. Just something's not plugged in right. Something's always, they're a little grumpy. Nick Grossibel here, man. He just works and works and works and works, and then you see him, and he's got a big old smile on his face. Just like, best attitude out of that guy. Great team, and Nick leads that team, and uh, very grateful for all they do. It's going to be an amazing night. We'll put that information in the show notes as well, just for the... um, for the, uh, the Nights of Worship coming up Saturday, Sunday. going to be amazing. We hope that you can be there for that. And then right behind that, Candlelight Christmas Eve services. Yeah, coming up um, just uh, will be two weekends after that. Christmas Eve is a Sunday this year, so mm-hmm. it's one of those really uh, unusual years. And, uh, of course, the schedule is, is on our website. Uh, what we've decided to do this year is just have – you know, a bunch of services on Christmas Eve, uh, some in the morning, some in the evening. That's the same service, basically. And uh, some people uh, may want to come morning and night. They're welcome to do that. Mm-hmm. But just the uh, the amount of effort, it just the, the better thing was just to have one service so you can come in the morning mm-hmm. and be a Christmas Eve, come in the afternoon, the evening, uh, different times at every one of our campuses. Um, but it'll be a great day at Calvary. Mm-hmm. It's going to be, uh, again, just another really great time, memorable time. Those are such sweet family traditions. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming to Christmas Eve is great. Uh, and the full schedule is at calvary.us. You can get every one of the services yep. we're doing. But uh, like you said, the Sunday morning schedule is the same across every campus, 9, 1045 at uh, Clearwater, Crystal Beach, and Eastlake, and 1030 at Seminole. And then there's services at 3 and 430. And they're all candlelight Christmas Eve services. All of them, including the morning services. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we've got, got some questions about that. All of them are candlelight services. If you want to come in the morning, you want to come both times, like you say, I mean, we'd love to have you come <laughs> every one of the services. You're welcome anytime you want to come. But uh, that's good. That's going to be what we do, and it is always sweet and special. The the Clearwater just turned. I got so many people to brag on, but the Clearwater lobby this week. You walked in there. Mm-hmm. That team always does an amazing job. It's just Christmas is here. Yep, yep. Uh, and uh, you know, shout out to the people. I have not been able to visit all the campuses. I, I think mm-hmm. they all look uh, wonderful. And I have seen, of course, Clearwater, and it's uh, really they took it up to another notch uh, this year. Yeah, um, Victoria Brown leads uh, that uh, helped lead a lot of that. One of our volunteers here. And uh, she and her husband go out to the Crystal Beach campus now a lot. Mm. Uh, but uh, they were also here, and uh, they really did just uh, – and then dozens and dozens of people helped. A lot of people. And uh, it looks absolutely fantastic. So a big thanks to um, – Victoria and all the volunteers mm-hmm. uh, who did a great job on the Christmas. They've been working, I understand, for several months. Yeah, oh yeah. Literally since like October to yep. get all of this done. Mm-hmm. And it looks fantastic. Yeah, lots of planning, lots of executing, and it does. It looks amazing. So all kinds of fun things going on. We'll put all that stuff in the show notes if you missed anything. I don't expect you to have been writing it down the whole time. You can go back and, and click in there and, and get information on everything we just talked about. We also this Sunday kicked off our new sermon series, uh, Once Upon a Time in Bethlehem, which I think some people didn't know we'd be covering Ruth during Christmas time. (laughs) Right, right, right. But uh, it's a pretty fun connection there. Well, it's our Advent series, and, you know, we uh, have these uh, four Sundays, the fourth being Christmas Eve, and uh, always pray hard about what to do uh, during this. So always a wonderful opportunity to teach about the Lord and the gospel. And um, this year we want to do something in the Old Testament. I remember back in the summer really thinking about this and and being drawn to uh, Ruth. And uh, some people will note, I've actually seen some people post uh, online, that we actually uh, here at Clearwater preached through Ruth Mm. uh, 10 years ago, uh, 2013. I don't expect other people to remember it that closely. Um, although I saw one post where somebody had because they had come to Christ during that series oh, and they wow. remembered it. But it was 2013, 10 years ago, but never as a Christmas series. So we kind of um, uh, brushed it off, dusted it up a little bit, uh, and uh, and uh, kind of reworked it to be a Christmas series. And uh, it's just a wonderful book to look at. And uh, so we're, we're enjoying walking through the Book of Ruth. Mm. Yeah, it's so it is. Uh, you know, you said, and I, we heard online too. A lot of people say this is their favorite Bible book. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think there's probably a lot of reasons for that. It is just a great read. It's just it's a great a story. story, a little short story, but just powerfully told, and then just such a beautiful truth. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and uh, and uh, and a good bit of it takes place in Bethlehem. In Bethlehem, almost all of it, um, and uh, and uh, and it does more even than that, as you'll see when we get to the end, mm-hmm. connect to. 
the birth of Christ. So it's an Old Testament story, but it is a reminder of uh, the gospel uh, being displayed at Bethlehem. It allows us to see that picture in a beautiful way, mm. and uh, we'll see that as we walk through it week by week. Mm. So this last Sunday, we talked a lot about, um, it, it, you know, like all good stories do, it starts with this tension, with mm-hmm. this, like, uh, we, we meet this family, and we walk through the first, a lot of the first chapter is a, a darkness. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a tragedy. There's, there's trauma all around. Like, yep. this, is, this is people displaced from their home and people uh, losing loved ones. Yep. And, and, uh, and so... I, I like I – mean, I don't like that you start there, but I think it's what's so great about the Bible and these stories is because there's just a nearness to those who are brokenhearted. When you look in the Bible, when you start reading the stories, and if you're hurt or you're mm-hmm. feeling lost or feeling abandoned, there's always stories that will – let you know that this is this is the the Bible represents those stories. Yeah, the, right. The Bible tells us the truth, the unvarnished truth. It's not just it's not a fantasy story. We'll try to make you feel better, chicken mm. soup for the soul kind of story. And no, it's going to tell you the truth. Mm. And the truth is sometimes dark and foreboding. Yeah. Uh, the truth can be scary and heavy. And if you don't acknowledge that, I'm I'm not sure you're really appreciating mm. what a powerful message the gospel is. So just as the gospel begins against, I mean, it really begins with God, but if you're telling the story of the world, it begins with this darkness, the the reality that we are, like the book of Romans, begins in the first chapters, climaxing, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Mm. Um, all of us, it's this brokenness, and you see it in told in the book of Ruth, where it, you begin with a famine, you begin with a um, a family in desperation, a family moving, a family then uh, losing, uh, death invades this family. Mm. So if you're hurting, if you're overwhelmed, if you're experiencing grief, um, you know, you identify with this story, and eventually every one of us are going to have uh, those uh, dark chapters, those difficult moments in our life. Life is um, full of difficult moments, and we live in a broken world in which sin is a reality, and sometimes suffering is a part of our existence. So mm. uh, it begins with that backdrop, a family hurting, broken, full of grief, uh, maybe even lacking hope. Mm. And I think uh, it's there's definitely some parallels, if I'm not mistaken, to that and the Christmas story. I mean, like we, we like to jump right yeah. to, you know, the Prince of Peace and the King mm-hmm. of Kings and and those type of triumphant things, mm-hmm. but if you if you step back a little from the birth from the manger scene, you'll see the context into which that scene. And I think there's some darkness there certainly for the Jewish people, isn't there? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it's a time of hardship. Uh, they're under the the thumb of Rome. You have Herod. Uh, you know, you ha- there's there's villains all the way through. You have. Uh, uh, you know, you have the difficult circumstances that Mary and Joseph find themselves in. We try to romanticize this journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Yes. Well, yeah. it would have been a long and difficult journey for someone that uh, that uh, pregnant. Right. And, uh, you know, the difficulty they encounter there. And then you have... Um, you know the uh, the the uh, drama of Herod finding out, uh, and uh, and um, you know ultimately there's even a slaughter of young boys in Bethlehem. Right. You you have Mary and Joseph escaping just before that happens, mm-hmm. warned um, in a dream. The wise men themselves were warned. So you just have this uh, already this evil shadow being cast over the birth of Christ, and yet in the midst of that, uh, hope. Hope mm-hmm. and again, unlikely characters, just like in the Book of Ruth. Mm-hmm. Um, this this fledgling family, this woman and her Moabite daughter-in-law. You go to the Christmas story, shepherds in the field, mm-hmm. uh, Mary and Joseph, a family no one knows anything about. Right. You know, um, and so there are so many. Yes, there are some similarities, and the Book of Ruth ends with a a, bu- a birth, and in a way, you could call it a miraculous birth. Not that the conception itself is by supernatural means, but the circumstances that had been arranged and knit together, certainly you see God's hand weaving it all, and uh, and a birth kind of ends the, you know, so the, the, the book, and again, we're jumping ahead, but the bur- book begins with a famine in the land. It ends, though, with the birth of children and mm-hmm. the lineage 
uh, being formed. Uh, you know, the Christmas story is about how a birth um, it becomes the means by which God sends his son to deliver the world from sin. Mm. So uh, all of this, and it just seems more than ironic that it all takes place here in the little town of Bethlehem. Yeah. So it's a great way to... Um, to weave the Christmas story into this Old Testament story, and um, and I, I think it'll be a wonderful month. Yeah, it's all right. It's off to such a great start. You talked about a couple things on Sunday because uh, we we you know, like you said it, it stories like this they acknowledge that darkness. We all yep. know that darkness is there. We say this a lot at Calvary, you know, in different conversations in different environments. But the world is broken, yep. and that is not something that people really like argue a ton. Um, but I love, I think you started with, I think it's a Keller quote where you were talking about, but the Christian and the Christian live somewhere, they, they, they live somewhere between yeah. not the optimist who says, if everybody tries real hard, yeah. we can fix everything. Yeah. Um, and, and not quite the pessimist that says it's a dystopian future and there is no right. hope. And I think that I loved when you read that quote, cause I was like, man, that is a tension. I think people feel, mm-hmm. um, neither seems true. Yep. They both seem inviting. They yep. both seem in, like, well, if I just yep. either cynicism or sentimentality, you know, whichever side you fall on. Mm-hmm. And it's not even the midpoint between the two. It's that neither one of them tell the whole story. And, uh, the whole story is one of, uh, that you must face the harsh reality of uh, our sin and the brokenness and the darkness of the world, and yet there is a hope that transcends all of that. And mm-hmm. that's the real story. And that's the real, because the optimist has this, um, uh, you know, hope that is very superficial and it tends to get blown out of the water. Mm-hmm. You know, through periods of time, uh, people were talking about even before World War One, there was a great optimism that the industrial revolution was ushering in this kind of millennial age mm-hmm. of peace and so forth and then it was uh, erupted the 20th century became the bloodiest and most uh, um, uh, costly in terms of war mm. uh, in in human history mm. optimism w- works until you get the diagnosis mm. until your child is suffering or rebelling or uh, between suffering comes into your life and if you have kind of rooted your faith in this optimistic Jesus is my lucky charm approach, it's going to run aground at some point. It is not going to be the kind of faith that sustains you. Um, We learn things in suffering and in difficulty that strengthen our faith and give us the kind of faith that can sustain us through the difficulties and trials Mm. that we're going to face. And you hear this sometimes, people will try to almost like poke holes in faith and they'll say well if 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 god then why do people get sick and Mm -hmm. why do people die Mm -hmm. why do bad things happen and i think it is such a the testimony of the christian faith is when you you acknowledge those things you you can't pretend those things don't happen you can't pretend the darkness isn't out there and you hold on to your faith and your hope yeah and the bible doesn't do that you know the bible doesn't ignore those realities it presents those realities Mm -hmm. and it presents a reason though there are many things we cannot fully comprehend and understand the bible does present a reason for this the why is the world uh in sin and error pining Mm. Well, go back and read Genesis 3 and the fall of man and the rebellion of man and the entrance of death into the world and the curse upon the ground. We know now why the world is in sin and error pining. It's not a sign of the absence of God at all. Um, And again, the person who becomes cynical, and I've said this in many ways at different times, still doesn't have an explanation for the world as it is Mm. because and we said this at the beginning you have to reckon with why the world is so beautiful and so broken at Mm. the same time you have to reckon why the world is so ordered and so disordered right and only the christian faith gives us the rational tools the faith perspective to understand this it is beautiful because god created the heavens and earth it is ordered because it is there is a god but it is disordered and broken because of sin and rebellion. Hmm. That tension exists. We live in that world. And Christmas is the light shining in the darkness. Hmm. And so the darkness is a reality which makes the light a more wonderful and glorious reality. Hmm. Hmm. And so people good. feel it in Christmas. Yeah, They do feel the darkness. And sometimes I think we feel it particularly... And most acutely when we're 
trying to imagine that everything is this perfect world, mm-hmm. you know. And we've talked about this before. People envision the perfect holidays and mm-hmm. the perfect meal and the perfect present. And then you find out the perfect present is sold out at Target and, you know, <laughs> uh, or, or uh, you know, the perfect meal eludes you because of something happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or the perfect family gathering doesn't come to be. Uh, or, you know, someone in your family is struggling during this holiday season. Mm-hmm. Or the many, many people in our church family who during this season are still battling grief. Mm-hmm. This is a reality. Um, we don't find Christmas because we ignore that. We find Christmas because we have a hope that transcends it. Yeah. And I love you. You touched on this even um, a little bit when you're in that darkness. This was a line I jotted down when you said it for sure. Uh, This was the quote, the decision you make when you cannot see the future will determine the future you see. Yeah. Yeah. uh, The decision uh, that you make when you can't see uh, determines the future one day you will see. Mm-hmm. You know, here's Ruth, and we were talking about the choice Ruth made. Yeah. And um, because you have two women here, uh, Orpah and Ruth, you mm-hmm. know, two Moabite women, both in the same situation. They've lost their husbands. They've lost their father-in-law, and their mother-in-law is giving them what seems to be very sound advice. Go back to your people. Go back to your gods, your family. I can't take care of you. Mm. Um, she's almost even saying, look, my God couldn't take care of you. Like, I had to leave Bethlehem because, you know, there was a famine in the land. I came over here, so Absolutely. you need to stay. I- I'll go back, see what happens. And it's almost as if Ruth shows m- more faith than Naomi in a way. Mm. Uh, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I'm going with you. It's almost as if Ruth sees what maybe in Naomi and her brokenness is struggling to see, mm. that uh, she's going to trust in the God of Naomi and, and uh and uh, and they go back. Yeah. And uh, it's Ruth's profession of faith, in essence. Somebody asked me, could that be described a profession of faith? Well, I don't know what a profession of faith looks like if it doesn't look like that. Your yeah. God will be my God. That is a radical uh, statement, a radical commitment for a Moabite woman. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Ruth makes this profession to the God of Israel. And that choice she sees nothing. She doesn't even know about Boaz, who we will That's meet right. in chapter 2. Yeah. Uh, there's no idea that uh, there's a kinsman redeemer awaiting her. Right. She just places her faith in God. And when she does, everything changes. And I think that's what faith is. Faith is sometimes, um, it, it, it can be described, I suppose, as trusting God. Mm-hmm. You just trust in God. We trust in God through his son, Jesus Christ. We don't have all the answers. We don't see all the future. Uh, we may or may not even be aware of the promises that God has made. Mm. When when I trusted Christ as a young boy, I was scarcely aware of all the many promises God had made. I was vaguely aware of them, but I trusted in God. And um, this is what it means to believe, to trust him. But the choice you make when you can't see the future mm determines the future you will one day see. Mm. And that choice that Ruth made changed everything. It sent her life on a trajectory. It brought her to God and to his people and into the promises of God. And as we will see by the end of this book, literally changes. And I suppose you would say it changes the world itself yeah. uh, because of what happens with Ruth and Boaz and the child they will one day conceive and the child that that child will conceive and so on, mm. uh, you know, giving the end away. But, uh, and the implications of what will become of that um, in even extending to us in Christmas. Yeah. And you go back to that single choice. And to me, that is a reminder for all of us. One, put your trust in the Lord. Mm-hmm. But also just the practical reminder to put our trust in the Lord when we stand at the crossroads. Mm. Um do we go back to what is familiar or easy or popular, um, or do we trust God? And there are going to be moments in your life where you'll trust God, and the only reason you will do so is because he calls you to trust him. Mm. You will obey him, and the only real good reason to do so is, well, because I should obey God, and I will obey God. And you can't see the future. You know, I want to say to young people, there there may be, uh, uh, you know, in a time of life when the moral confusion of our age presses upon them, and they're making choices. But the choice you make when you can't see the future determines the future you will one day see. At 16, you don't see your future family. Right. 
You don't see what 30 looks like. Right. 30, you don't see what 50 looks like. Who can? We don't see the future. Mm-hmm. But the choices you make at 16 may well determine the future you experience at 30. Yeah. And many other examples as well. Uh, so, again, we, we can't change the past. If someone's living with regret, I, right. this is not to heap a burden upon you. You give it to the Lord. The point is, what are you going to do at this crossroads? What are you going to do at this Christmas? What are you going to do today? Are you going to trust God, and are you going to move forward trusting him? Mm. The choice you make at that crossroads determines the future you'll one day see. Yeah. It's such a good, it's such a good sentiment. It's such an important message. Um, and, and it is one that it's, it, what's interesting as you're, as you're explaining it more, it's funny that we almost get it completely reversed. We almost think, well, if I have enough faith, I'll never see the darkness. I'll never be at a point where I can't see like my faith should avoid those moments. Okay. And it feels like in truth, it's like in the dark moments, that's when your faith is that's most faith, critical. Yeah. Yeah. Faith is believing in what we don't see. It's yeah. trusting when we can't see the outcome. That is what real faith is. Yeah. It's interesting. Another line you uh, well, just one of the points we went you went through the you kind of broke down that commitment where will I where I will go and that was kind of, we talked about direction and again I'll put the uh, the sermon in the show notes if you missed it. I won't go through all of it. There was one point I wanted to talk about. Where I will go is the direction where I will stay. Talk to, you, you unpacked something about relationships. And, and convictions in that point, and then who I will trust uh, about trusting in God. Yep. The point I, wa- I was a little interested in following up on is the uh, where I will stay, the relationships. Mm-hmm. I think yep. that one is so you, you spent a little time there uh, on Sunday, um, but I think that's tough for people to navigate mm-hmm. because it's tough to uh, you don't want to just cut people out of your life no, and be no, mean no, and be no. you know especially in the holidays and you have that <laughs> togetherness. You you're, you err on the side. Oh, just spend time with yep. the people. Um, so, so how important is that though, to, to really be discerning about the relationships that well, you've got? Well, you know, Proverbs says, I think it's 1322, uh, you know, the, com- the companion of fools suffers harm and he that walks with the wise grows wiser. Mm. I think it's 1322, but somebody will check me out. I didn't check it here. Yeah. Um, a uh, companion of fools suffers harm. It's just a principle of life. Mm-hmm. It's true. And everyone knows it's true. We've all seen it. Um, and no, this is not a call to be aloof or unkind or to cut people off without mercy or tenderness, but there are decisions and, and I'm not certainly not talking about, you know, leaving your marriage or that, you know, uh, I, I, every, I, I realize every situation is, is different and unique in, in some ways. I'm talking about that, you know, when you, when you, you know, the companion of fools, mm-hmm. the companion, like, who are you hanging around? Like, who are you doing life with? Mm-hmm. Um, who are you investing in? I mean, I've seen it with, you know, we've all seen it when we think of young people. Who are they hanging around determines they start acting. We've seen this. Yeah. Most people who have had kids have seen this. If you right. hang around a certain group of kids and all of a sudden you hear them start using words and talk mm-hmm. about things. And again, uh, sometimes maybe your kid's part of the problem. I'm not saying they're not part of the problem, but we've all seen that. You, yeah. you, um, you know, if you take a white glove and put it in mud, it doesn't make the mud glovey. It mm-hmm. makes the glove dirty. Right, right. And, you know, one thing impacts the other and, and not necessarily vice versa. So the idea uh, is I've seen it in adults. I've seen it with people, for instance. And again, I, I have to be careful with, you know, descriptions because I realize every situation is different. But I've seen people maybe struggling in a marriage and um, and then they hang around people who who are also struggling in their marriage or maybe divorced or broken marriages. Mm-hmm. I've seen uh, women, for instance, who are struggling maybe with understanding their husband and working through a difficult time. And, and then this, you know, maybe a woman will get a couple of girlfriends who have been yep. divorced. Well, who are you talking to? Mm-hmm. You know, and what perspective do you think you're going to be getting? Yeah. And again, that's not a shot to say you shouldn't have divorced friends. I'm not saying of that. Course. I'm saying... Be careful who you're listening to. Are they godly? Mm-hmm. Are they grounded in Scripture? Are they seeking the Lord, uh, whether they're single or married or whatever? Are they f- trying to follow the Lord? Or are they living a worldly life? And I've seen it in adults. You start hanging around uh, fools, you will become foolish. Yeah. It, you will suffer harm. Yeah. Uh, so who are you going to be a companion with? Yeah. He who walks with the wise becomes wiser. What does it mean to walk with someone? Uh, you know, 
uh, walking with the wise means I'm reading books written by the wise. Mm-hmm. I'm listening to the wise speak. I'm making sure that key relationships in my life are the people who will help me grow in the Lord. That's not selfishness. That's wisdom. And um, there are times in people's lives where they have to remove themselves from certain relationships that are just harmful. Mm. And you don't do that with unkindness or lack of love. Maybe there's still an open door for a person who changes. But um, there are times you have to say, look, I can't do that anymore. Yeah, um, I'm not going to hang with those people in the bar Mm -hmm. anymore Mm -hmm. if I'm struggling with alcoholism or ungodliness, you know, that, Mm -hmm. that now I need to realize, okay, I've got to walk with some people who are wise and can help me become wiser. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, you struggle to get examples because somebody will, will read the wrong thing into it. But the principle is there. It's in the Bible. Companion to fools suffers harm. So look, you know, you can think it's mean if you want to, but you, you companion to fools, Right. I, I promise you this, you're going to suffer harm. Right. And if you walk with people who are wise, I promise you this, you, you'll become wiser. Yeah. No, I'm so glad you brought it up because I do. And I think people compartmentalize it to kids and students. And, mm-hmm. they, and they're like, yeah, if you're in high school, that's how. Yeah, yeah. But like you said, I mean, you don't want to, the examples do get sticky. But I, I can tell you, men who go to work at a job and everybody they work with is on their second, third, fourth marriage. Yep, and yep. before they started spending yep. all their time there, you know, all of a sudden their yep, marriage yep. is, is yep. going through it. So you, you do, you need to be aware of that type of thing. I That's thought that right. was a great reminder. You know, one, uh, you, you, you can either, look, you, you will not be alone if you live a godly life, if you have a, a spiritual community. You will not be alone, but you will be in a minority in this world. Hmm. And uh, I, I just say it repeatedly to Christians. You, you've you got to be okay with being in a minority. Mm. Um, you just have to be. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder because mm. our culture is a very hostile culture to Christian faith now and growing more so. So we need to prepare our children and our, our young people. Um, look, you, you, you need to have spiritual communities. You need to walk with the wise. But you, you cannot um, – so you don't have to be isolated, mm-hmm. but you're not going to be in the majority. Right, right. And you need to be okay with that. Right. You need to be okay with that. Yeah, and I thought it was, it's a great example of what we see here in Ruth. It's about being intentional with well, that Ruth community left you Moab. chose. Yeah. He left Moab. Yeah. She left Moab. Abraham left her. Yeah. Uh, you have to leave something to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of us don't want to leave where we're at to go where we want. Yeah. Well, sometimes you have to leave where you are to go where you want. It's so good. You have to leave somewhere to go somewhere. You just see it. It's so good. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for unpacking that. Again, if you missed the full sermon, we'll put that in the show notes. Uh, I have one last question I, I think um, we're all wondering, and I, I'm going to hit you with, Pastor. What's going on with some of these Christmas songs? 12 Days of Christmas. What are we What are we doing here with all these birds? <laughs> All the birds. What? Which, the, which the one? Turtle, is the, bird? The, the, the partridge turtle in a pear tree. I have literally no idea. Doves. I don't think I've ever understood that song. What? I, I think um, so. I heard it explained somewhere, but it's. Uh, um, I don't know if it's a, an English thing or something. I have no idea. I don't. I don't want turtle doves. I don't want. <laughs> Lords a leaping. Oh, he does. I no one does. So, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. There's some strange songs. My wife was walking. We were walking and. There was some silly song being played, and she said, you know, these Christmas songs that, we're not trying to be snobbish here, but Christmas songs that aren't faith-based, she said, it's starting to sound so silly to me. And then, of course, I was being smart aleck and mentioned some songs that, that we do love at Christmas. Yeah, yeah, that, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, I'll be home for Christmas or something. Sure. That, you know. So there are some very good just holiday songs. Right. But I, I believe my wife's point is well taken. Uh, that, uh, like, sometimes I'll see on television they're having a Christmas show. Like, uh-huh. it's a country Christmas show oh, from right, Nashville. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, Carrie Underwood, whoever, whatever. Mm-hmm. So you turn it on, you know, it's uh, whatever. And everyone has a Christmas show, you know. Lady Gaga has a Christmas They're show or whatever. Christmas so, show, you know, right. so you turn it on. And, the, and, you know, what are they singing about? I don't even know. It's like, what? I don't know. And you come to the Christmas nights of worship here. The difference is just unbelievable. Oh, yeah. You know, and um, so I, 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 you know, I'm all for some fun Christmas songs. You right. know, who, you know, who doesn't like uh, uh, chestnuts roasting on the open fire? Come or, on. You yeah, know, that's you know, great. You know, thanks. But... You know, there's just nothing about, nothing like focusing right. on Jesus 
and what this season means in the birth of Christ. It's so true. And that is the 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 most important point. But it has really struck me this year, same as Cheryl. I was yeah. listening to the most wonderful time of the year. And yeah. they said, you know, there'll be parties for hosting and marshmallows for toasting. And then they say, and there'll be scary ghost stories. <laughs> and I just was like, we've allowed this for decades. <laughs> Who's telling scary ghost stories at Christmas? Yeah, well, time? you know, it's it's interesting. It's Christmas is kind of a ghost story. You have holy, you know, you have angels appearing. There I talked about that go. a couple of years ago. So, uh, but I guess that's you know an entertainment kind of thing. Scary ghost stories. Uh, scary ghost stories, and then even I'll be home for Christmas. I think I've talked to you about before. At the end, he says I'll be home for Christmas if only in my dreams. Yeah, it's a kind of a bait and switch. And you're it? saying, well, do we set out the plate, Mike? <laughs> This isn't helpful. We're trying to get who's going to pick you in the drawing. Because if you're not here, I don't know. we got to figure some of these out. Christmas Night of Worship here at Calvary, all great songs. You don't have to worry about We that. might. And maybe I'll be home for Christmas. May- oh, oh, yeah, no. that is true. I should have looked be, through the set list before I started saying that. Them, yeah. Uh, it's going to be amazing, though. Again, we talked about a lot of stuff. I'll put a lot of stuff in the show notes if you missed anything and you want to go back and uh, catch up on those things. Pastor Willie, thank you for diving in on some uh, follow-up to the sermon. It's uh, It's been it's our kickoff to a great series. It's going to be a great couple of weeks here at Calvary, uh, and we hope to see you at any of our campuses and at our Christmas night of worship this coming weekend. And we love you, and we'll be back with another podcast episode here very soon.